So while we wait for Richard to come back, um, maybe we could just look a little bit uh, about what we're going to talk about today, which is the G7 summit. And um, we're going to focus specifically on climate and what the, the meeting achieved and what the leaders agreed on climate and also what they uh, sort of what we know about their discussions on Ukraine. And uh, but first, before we start that, we have with us as speakers both uh, our uh, Europe and Central Asia uh, Deputy Programme Director, Alyssa, and we also have with us the Director of Innovation and the Deputy Programme Director of the Conflict Programme, um, Champa. So, Alyssa, uh, I wanted to first ask you to maybe tell us, because you were actually just in Ukraine, um, and just came back, I think, this weekend. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, what you encountered during your research there? And, um, you know, how did you feel that the conversations on the ground were um, sort of, before we talk about, you know, the more high level uh, discussions that happened at the G7. So Alyssa, if you could unmute yourself and then I'll give the floor to you. Sure, thank you, Alistair. And um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here on the first one, technical, technical issues aside. Um, yeah, so I, I left Ukraine um, and had a bit of a taste of um, a taste without all of the physical, you know, the, the emotions um, that some of the Ukrainians fleeing were having um, because um, I left Ukraine on Saturday night um, and woke up to the train having broke down and um, everybody looking at their phones and reading about the air sirens in Kiev and the, the missile strikes, which of course happened uh, during the G7 summit um, and nervously calling relatives and checking, you know, um, how everybody was and went on to uh, have to scramble for um, Mashrutsky, or like little buses and taxis to get to the border and cross the border for three hours on foot where, you know, um, I was next to a woman who was, um, had been evacuated from Herson um, and was on her way to Texas. Um, and, you know, many, many people in the mine had um, the stories that we've come to hear already for months, um, but um, people you know, leaving areas that have been um, recently come under Russian control, um, which gives you a sense of the continuing and evolving conflict. Um, you know, I think for um, G7 leaders, obviously, um, the airstrikes on Kiev, which were the first in quite a while, and then followed up by the horrific strike on um, the um, wall, um, which killed at least uh, 18 people, I think, and, and, and counting, um, you know, we're really um, strengthening resolve during the G7 discussions. Um, you know, there's a back and forth between leaders in the West about um, what kind of response um, Russia should, uh, you know, the West should be having to Russia, uh, not only in terms of supplying weapons, which is obviously the discussion at the NATO summit now, um, and not only in terms of um, economic support, which was, or or trying to raise the cost of this war for Russia, which was um, largely the discussion of the G7 uh, summit, but also about, you know, whether we should even talk now um, and, you um, the big splits being between France and, and the UK on this, whether we should even talk now about um, what comes next. Um, I think what you've heard over and over is that, um, and I think this was repeated at the NATO summit, um, that Western leaders are saying that they're going to back Ukraine as long as it takes, um, which is a bit of the mood that I felt in Kyiv um, and in some of our research in Western Ukraine um, and other areas with IDPs. Um, people are starting to brace and come to terms with the fact that this is going to be a longer conflict um, than many people thought. And so, you know, that is focusing minds not only on the need for weapons, although that comes up in every single conversation, whether it's economics or the situation with IDPs, um, every Ukrainian politician that I met with, um, you know, raised the issue that we need more weapons sooner. Um, but people are also thinking about um, the return to schools and how do they have bomb shelters in all the schools and how do they encourage some of the population who have left, the millions of people have left to come back to the country and how do they keep uh, the currency afloat and how do they keep uh, the economy going and how do they build shelters for internally displaced people um, to survive through the winter. So all of these questions are also on the minds. Uh, Alexa, it, yeah. it's really great to hear this. And, and you mentioned, I want to go back to one of the points that you mentioned, which was that, you know, we've heard 
uh, Western leaders say that they want to back Ukraine until the end, and that that sentiment is something that you also felt during your research in Ukraine. We have also heard um, Western leaders talk about the risk of war fatigue and that they worry that that people are are sort of you know the attention is shifting elsewhere that now that the sort of impact of 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 the war the global impact is being felt um prices are rising and you know especially prices of gas uh, of gas uh, people are, are worried about the their living costs um just before we sort of move to the g7 mm-hmm. what was your feeling about war fatigue during your conversations, during your research in, in Ukraine. And for those that have just joined us, this is um, Crisis Group's first Twitter space. We're going to discuss what the the conversations uh, following the G7 or at the G7, what the G7 leaders uh, decided or, or discussed on Ukraine and also on climate and how these uh, topics actually are interlinked is something that we will discuss as well. But we're first hearing from our uh, Europe and Central Asia Deputy Program Director, Alisa, who was just in Ukraine. She's just come back. Uh, she's been doing field research there. And so, uh, Alisa, the question is, you know, do you sense yeah. war fatigue or did you sense Thanks. war fatigue? Yeah, thanks, Astrid. I think, I know, that's a really great question, because actually, um, it was a question that I got from most of the people I spoke to. Um, so whether you're speaking, you know, we, we were doing research, um, um, our Ukraine analyst will have a briefing out shortly on the situation with internally displaced people. So we were doing research, speaking to volunteers, speaking to international humanitarian actors, speaking to politicians, Ukrainian politicians, um, um, speaking to local officials in some of the regional governments. Um, and often um, I got asked, you know, how deep is Western support? Are they really willing you know, that there's maybe a bit of a feeling that the, the from these actors who are really on the front lines dealing with people, dealing, you know, thinking ahead to the winter already, um, there is a really question of like, will, will, you know, will we get um, the money that we need um, to to keep going, to build shelters, to rebuild? And and so there is a question um, from the actors on the ground about, um, you know, whether uh, Western support will continue to be forthcoming. And, you know, it was interesting that Zelensky spoke at the NATO summit today and, you know, he asked for more modern artillery and weapons, but he also said that financial support is really important. And, and currently, um, you know, Ukraine has a, a budget deficit monthly of, um, of 5 billion a month that it's spending on defense. So, you know, the other questions are, are really real um, there. Um, I think also, you know, from volunteers and 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 on the ground, you know, they they are seeing less. Um, you know, in Ukraine, it was an amazing effort. Basically, um, the international humanitarian actors are slower to deploy, um, obviously, and Ukraine has a very active civil society, and so groups from human rights groups to uh, you know, you name it, football clubs, um, jumped in and started um, helping to get uh, both uh, what the military needed in terms of food and sleeping bags and things like that, but also really um, helping internally displaced people find home, um, you know, helping to create spaces in the shelters, helping to send medicine or food to people through the post, which is still functioning um, really quite well. Um, And so all of these groups did get quite a lot of support from miners abroad in uh, that they that they might you know if they were more established NGOs um, partners abroad that had been funding them in the past and very flexibly kind of shifted over, um, but also you know people donating funds um, to help uh, and they're seeing less and less of that so there is a concern there as well. Um, I could keep going. Oh, thank leave you. It there. Thank you, <laughs> uh, Alisa. I think we have. Um, do I dare see Richard uh, Gowan, who is our moderator? Um, uh, oh, we hear you. Okay, well, um, immense apologies, everyone. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure what happened there. Something went wrong with my phone, and I was uh, struggling with that, but now I'm back um, and really glad to rejoin the conversation. Um, Alyssa, I think you were just talking about uh, what you saw in Ukraine. Um, maybe we can pivot now to what the G7 said about Ukraine and and how effectively you thought the G7 responded to uh, the current situation that the Ukrainians are facing and uh, whether you think that this was the right response. Uh, 
from uh, from Bavaria. Um, thanks, Richard. Um, well, I, I think we'll have more of a discussion around it. Um, uh, you know, uh, sort of conclusions and statements from the G7 when Chumpa can jump in. Um, but you know, the G7 was not short on statements. Um, that's for sure. Um, in terms of actual solid uh, responses, um, you know, there there's a plan to ban gold import from Russia. Um, and sort of the beginnings of, uh, of uh, another policy line in terms of trying to introduce price caps um, on Russian oil. Um, so gold is important to Russia, and that's, um, I guess, a part of the wider trade picture. But um, for all intents, this is, as I understand it, it's rather symbolic because gold refiners have, or the industry itself has um, effectively self-sanctioned by removing Russia from um, the certifying body removed, um Russian gold refiners already, I think, back in March. Um, and then, you know, on the, on the second policy, um, this, this um, big news around uh, a price cap on Russian oil, um, you know, that's a, that's a really interesting one. Russian oil has been selling at a discount uh, for some time now already. Um, so, of course, the goal is to reduce the amount of revenue that Russia is getting. Um, you know, oil revenue is integral to its economy, um, and um, Western leaders have been doing everything in terms of sanctions to try to reduce that war chest. Um, but there's another aspect to it, which is that they want to force down uh, – the, the price of oil and, and take the heat out of the global markets um, and help with these really soaring inflationary prices at home. Um, so the proposal is effectively to create um, sort of a buyer's cartel, um, which is also interesting because it flies in the face of a lot of antitrust policies in some states and some people have been talking about that. But um, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting proposal in that it would, you know, sort of do hit two birds with one stone um, and um, and so we'll have to see how that moves forward because it's not at all a deal. Um, it's a very difficult thing um, to do uh, at home. And I think there will still need to be quite a lot of discussion around it. Um, the other thing at the G7 is that, you know, it did happen right before uh, the NATO summit. So a lot of the discussions there were bleeding over into questions of military support for Ukraine. Um, so I know, you know, Jake Sullivan, uh, U.S. National Security Advisor, did come forward and brief journalists on a plan for um, the U.S. to send um, sort of medium to long range surface to air missile systems for Ukraine uh, that they've been asking for for a while. Um, so it, the focus was mainly economic, um, but um, but really, I think people were the leaders there were looking ahead towards the NATO summit and what kind of military support Ukraine was going to get. Richard, I, I mean, I can leave it there, but uh, <laughs> I think Rid having uh, some okay. upstate New York, so uh, uh, he's at home with a uh, uh, working from home today. So uh, I think that we will just continue, and maybe he we will be able to get him back on later. Um, Alyssa, thank you for that. I mean, I think it would also be interesting. You've sort of summar summarized, you know, the amount of statements that have come from the G seven, and we also see now three sort of meetings you know we have the the european council that met a few weeks ago then we had the g7 and now already we also have nato leaders um is there anything when you take these sort of three events together um that that you, have you learned anything or is there something that we can say about western leader support we saw that boris johnson said that he was worried about war fatigue as i, as I mentioned earlier um what is it that sort of you, we at crisis group see when we look at these these events together? Obviously, the, the NATO summit is upcoming this weekend. No, I mean, I think it's right to, to look right together. I mean, there's a lot of the same leaders going from one to the other. Um, and, you know, in discussions with uh, in one of my discussions with um, uh, um, an official from uh, European capital, um, the question was, um, so how do we ensure unity at these three summits coming ahead? Um, so I think that's very much on the minds. Um, and I guess that's that would be my my summary from the you know the three taken together in the sense that um, you know it was a very important sort of sim also relatively symbolic at the moment um, because EU members or, or the EU's offer of uh, candidacy status to Ukraine is obviously a, an extremely long road um, in terms of joining the bloc one day. Um, I mean, this is a country with an active war going on, um, and we've seen that um, 
how slow enlargement has been for some of the countries in the Balkans. Um, nevertheless, um, this was a very you know important and strong symbolic move that um, some of the activists and politicians that I spoke to in Kiev were, you know, through their exhaustion and their fatigue of dealing with the humanitarian crisis and dealing with war, were nonetheless celebrating. Um, and and um, you know, one one activist said to me, at least, even if it's symbolic, at least they had the courage to do that. So you know that that did have um, a resonance in Kiev. Um, and then you know, if we look to the G7 once again after the airstrikes and in general, the the the, the desire is to keep repeating that there will be. Uh, support for Ukraine as long as it takes. Um, and I think Johnson, as you pointed out, was very, um, you know, was able to kind of say it's not the time to talk about uh, what comes after an end to the fighting or an end to the fighting. Um, he was, you know, um, the, he has taken a stronger line uh, than some other uh, European um, capitals in that sense or European leaders in that sense. Um, and, you know, if we look ahead to the NATO summit, um, we crisis group wrote a piece um, predicting and saying uh, from our analysis of talking to a whole bunch of people um, that, um, you know, Turkey objecting to Sweden and Finland's NATO membership might be uh, a more protracted crisis than it turned out to be, at least uh, last uh, through the NATO summit. I think the fact that um, all, you know, in, in shuttle diplomacy and discussions ahead of time, including on the sidelines of these other summits, um, they were able to come to a place where uh, Turkey has dropped its objections now, shows just how important it is for Europeans to show a united front um, and to deal, you know, even if it comes at a price or, um, you know, there is a concern amongst uh, a lot of, in Washington and in Brussels, uh, about kind of um, giving in or rewarding Turkey when it's um, um, trying to bargain for some something or some asks. Um, but the desire to show unity kind of was more important in this case, I think. Excellent. And um, you mentioned the crisis group briefing that we put out last week um, ahead of, of the G7 meeting, where an area that we haven't covered yet, but I think is really important, is the global commodities crisis and and the, the shockwaves that are being felt around the world. Um, in the piece, we, we really urge Western leaders to, to continue to show a united front, but also to take real action to address the commodities crisis. Um, Alyssa and Champa, I know that you can both speak about this. Um, I don't know, Alyssa, do you want to just start a little bit about, you know, I think, I think Champa can jump in. I've been speaking for a while now. Okay. So Champa, can I hand over to you just to tell us a little bit about, you know, what is Crisis Group urging Western leaders to do? How can we, um, how can the, the commodities crisis be, be, be addressed and sort of the pain, help alleviate the pain that is being felt and mostly being felt maybe in, in the countries that can least afford it? Thanks, uh, Asdis, and great to be part of the conversation. I mean, as you say, the commodity shocks that we saw rising from the wall and then the subsequent sanctions have had massive reverberations through global markets, really impacting so food, fuel and fertilizer, the essential commodities of the world. And what we're seeing now is the kind of, you know, the increased food insecurity in particular regions um, is something that needs to be dealt with urgently. So, you know, I think the key meeting to think through what could the G7 do to ameliorate these shocks? How would they support people who are facing uh, these issues? And unfortunately, I think it's fair to say that the statements that have been issued so far and the discussions that were had fell short of what's actually needed. I mean, on the one hand, you have statements saying, you know, it's for global alliance on food insecurity, which is welcome to get food in, um, to increase funding, to allow food to get to the places that are most conflict or climate vulnerable, uh, such as in the Horn of Africa. But it's packaging food as aid. In all, and, and part of this is because they don't want to, you know, impact food prices in global markets. But the issue with that is you, if you address this as food as aid, you're not really dealing with the root causes. This is a supply and crisis. What we have are issues that pre-existed before the war uh, caused by COVID-19, where supply chains were really stressed and then exacerbated through what we're seeing happening with the invasion of Ukraine. So I think in that respect, the G7 didn't put anything forward that really tackles the need to you know, accelerate uh, the move towards green energy transition, to diversify food systems, um, the world is hugely reliant on very few countries for the bulk of its food. And there was nothing here in the sort of financing commitments that were made uh, by G7 countries that really went to the root of what caused this. So while we might deal with 
you know, um, ameliorating the shocks, providing temporary support to those who most need it. The issue is in the long term, we're going to face shocks like this again. And we're going just as vulnerable in facing them because nothing's been done to deal with the underlying causes. Thank you, Champa, for, for that. And I mean, as you say, this is a longer term crisis. In our paper, we pointed out that, you know, the World Food Programme has warned that 325 million people are marching towards starvation. Um, you know, the, the G7 not addressing this this um, in a more sort of concrete way. Um, where do you think the, the global conversation is, is going? Um, what, what, what would we as crisis groups sort of want to see leaders do now? Um, since the moment maybe was not seized to the fullest uh, at the G7 forum? Yeah, I think there's a number of things um, that can be done. So one is to allow countries to have a bit more fiscal headroom in order to deal with crises. So one of the things the crisis group is calling for is for use of the IMF special drawing rights. Now, these are where countries can recycle. Um, it's based on, you know, the votes that people have within the IMF. So what tends to happen is the richer countries are able to draw on financial support in a way the poorer countries aren't. Um, but you can recycle your SDRs. So in that respect, what we'd like to see is richer countries recycle their SDRs and allocate that economic support to poorer countries, which can then help them manage the debt that they have, help them provide subsidies to their populations, help them, you know, um, have price caps that may help with uh, food products within the country. So to help them put in place the sort of social safety nets that are lacking at the moment, that they may not have the financial resources to do so. So one thing G7 countries can do is to support that process of recycling SDRs so the poorer countries can have the support that they need. The other is to ease supply chain disruption. So it's all well and good to provide emergency food assistance, but what we really need to see, and this is why I think the G7 fell slightly short, is we, we accelerate that investment in renewables, ensure that that green energy transition happens, because at the moment what we have is a slight tension between G7 countries wanting to have their cake and eat it. So saying in the short term, we need to invest funding in natural gas production. It's a transitional thing. It's not for the long term. We're only going to do it for now while we ensure that we have energy security, but we're still going to meet our long term climate goals. And that is how do you square that circle? Because the investment that we're going to see into fossil fuel production is going to increase emissions. That's going to run counter to what we're trying to do in terms of climate change goals. So I think in that respect, it fell short of what was needed. But in addition to food aid, in addition to helping countries with their debt burden, give, uh, allowing them to have the financial tools to be able to support their populations, more can be done to think through what can be done to ease supply chain disruptions, support countries in the global south to diversify their crops so that we are less reliant on very few countries for the source of our food. Um, these are some of the steps that the rich countries can take. Thank you, Champan. One of the things that the crisis group also pointed to in, in, in that paper, you know, just you've sort of focused on that we we can't, well, first of all, one crisis isn't isolated from another. And, and Ukraine, the U war in Ukraine really shows that, you know, that it has knock on effects and exacerbates other conflicts as well. Um, one of the points that we make in our G7 briefing is that the world needs to get better at dealing with more than one crisis at a time. Uh, we have urged the G7 to look at, at other conflicts as well. We, you know, urge them to look at Afghanistan, where steps need to be taken to reverse the country's economic collapse and alleviate the horrifying humanitarian disaster. Um, in Lebanon, the country's elite has to be pushed to make needed reforms so the IMF can start restoring the broken financial system to honestly just stop the state from falling apart. In Ethiopia, of course, there is the still the civil war is ongoing um, and the list goes on. But one of the things we also talked about is that we really wanted to, to see the G7 focus on the impact of climate change on international security. Um, you've sort of given us an example of, of the, the how climate and the Ukraine war are interlinked. But could you talk a little bit, Champa, about what the G7 leaders discussed about or, you know, what the results were of their conversations? What do we know about their conversations on climate and, and um, sort of what is, what is your opinion of that? Well, the German hosts have always been really clear that climate is an essential part of the G7 agenda. And despite everything that's happening with Ukraine, you know, they insisted that that was going to be a key plank of the discussions. Um, but in several key areas, we either saw active backsliding or sort of stasis, as in no movement at all in terms of what needs to be done in order to meet their climate, climate obligations, which in turn then would help reduce conflict risks. 
So to give an example, um, there was a previous commitment made by the G7 to end investments in overseas uh, fossil fuel projects by the end of the year. But that's been tempered. So in the current G7 statement, what they say is there's an exception in limited circumstances um, to allow for fossil fuel production. And that's because they're trying to shore up their energy security in the short term. But as I was saying earlier, it goes against the long term objectives of what they're trying to achieve. And it's not clear to me how you can take this approach of intensifying fossil production in the short term and still meet your targets in the long term. Um, they have announced new initiatives that are welcome. They're promising more financing to uh, countries to help them with a clean energy transition, countries such as India, Indonesia, Vietnam, um, Senegal is another country. You know, they've promised to pledge more than billions of euros towards uh, funding energy transition in those countries. So that, that's a good forward step. But at the same time, it, it's very concerning that what they're looking to do in the short term does represent some kind of backsliding on commitments that were previously made. Um, and it's not just gas, it's coal as well. You know, I think there was a lot of hope that in these discussions, the G7 would set a deadline for phasing out coal. And in fact, actually, we see the reverse as countries, um, Germany is one of them, have said that they're going to invest in coal power stations to keep the lights and heating on this winter. So our worry is that the commitments that have been made on the climate side are welcome. But if you look at them in a little bit more detail, they don't really go beyond reaffirming commitments that had already been made before. And there's a little bit of a worry that they kick the can down the road because what they talk about is, we'll flesh this out, the forthcoming uh, COP uh, set to take place in November in Egypt, which is the climate change, International Climate Change Conference, or the G7 in 2023. So it's essentially, it doesn't really go beyond reaffirming commitments made and then saying that the details will come later. But the urgency of the issues we face now, whether it's fuel or food or fertilizer that's also essential for food production, require urgent action now. It's not something that can really wait, you know, once down the line to really what's needed. Indeed, and this is of course one of the things that our um, president and CEO, Comfort Arrow, who, who you know, as, as the sort of um, head of crisis group is of course thinking about 70 plus conflicts, but she has said that climate change is one of the things that keeps her up at night and the link between climate and conflict. Champa, could you make me just talk a little bit about that? And I also want to invite our listeners. Thank you all so much for being here with us. Um, we have about 20 more minutes. So if there are any questions, you can either just send us a direct message here on Twitter uh, to the Crisis Group account, or you can write them in a reply to the latest tweet about the space, which is on our account, or you should simply see it here on your phone or on your desktop where you're listening, and then we will be able to address the questions. I will be able to set, um, address some of them here. Um, but while we wait for questions, just Champa, if you could talk a little bit about climate security and why Crisis Group is putting so much emphasis on that when leaders are discussing um, climate, for example, at the G7, but also in the upcoming COP in, in November, that conflict has to be part of the conversation. And maybe if you could give us a bit of a sense of where that conversation is today. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, to us, it's critical that conflict is part of that conversation, because half of the um, most climate fragile countries in the world also experience conflict. There's no way to talk about one without talking about the other. And what we find is that the peace and security debates you know, the ones that take place through the United Nations Security Council see climate as the province of the UNFCC, which oversees the climate work that's done internationally. And the UNFCC sees peace and security as the remit of the Security Council. So it slips between the gaps. But if we want to have effective action to reduce emissions, if we want to ensure a just and clean energy transition, if we want to make sure that people are supported through um, the ways in which climate change is impacting livelihoods, it's impacting the ability to access food, it's in, impacting the ability to grow food. If we want to make sure that people are protected against the harmful effect of climate change, we need to make sure the conflict is part of that conversation. So what we do at Crisis Group is through our research and through our analysis, show those pathways, show the ways in which climate change is impacting conflict risks, how it's shaping, how it's informing what's happening, so, for example, what, we've, uh, what we're doing at the moment is looking at, you know, how is flooding impacting the conflict dynamics in the South Sudan? How is it driving displacement? What are the specific trajectories that we see that drive people to move away because of climate change? And then what does this mean then for where they end up and the conflict risks they place, either through, you know, being displaced or where they, uh, where they, where they land with host communities? So I think this is what we're trying to do through our work is show the specific ways in which climate change is a threat multiplier show the ways in which it's impacting people's lives, and show that if you want to have effective action on climate change, you really need to think through how do you do that in conflict settings? 
How do you make sure that the, the tools, the productivities that we want to put forward are going to be impactful because we've recognized that they need to be done in a sensitive way? It's essential that it's part of the conversation. And at the moment, what we find is it slips through the gaps because it's difficult to talk about. How do you do climate adapt in a context of poor governance, non-state actors, you know, an ongoing conflict? But just because it's difficult doesn't mean that it's not necessary. And we're going to fail in our efforts if we don't take the needs of conflict impacted populations into consideration. Thank you, Champa. I, I think, uh, Alyssa, you could also speak on back here because, um, you know, Champa has now laid out the problems and the, the fact that we are sort of missing a, a very important, a potentially a very, it's a dangerous oversight to not put conflict directly into the equation and, and see how conflict and climate change are linked and how how, how climate change is a, a threat multiplier, as Champa always says. Uh, but Alyssa, you know so much about the the energy uh, sector and especially in the EU and you know what is your view on the goals and the sort of goals that leaders have set themselves with climate change especially given the conflict in Ukraine do you think we will be seeing um, a step back? Thanks Astos I mean I, I'll just reiterate um, you know Trumpa was absolutely right in the way that she phrased it um, I think with a with a bit of a focus on the EU because as you said I, I <laughs> five, six years of covering uh, climate and energy regulation um, with Reuters. Um, and I think that's the main message is these headline targets are being left unchanged. So the kind of pace um, that we saw over the last couple of years of you know, climate ambition and really having that as a focus dipped a bit already with the pandemic and now um, energy security is kind of trumping everything. Um, so Champa did point out, you know, um, I think the contrast is stark between um, the coup that Merkel secured in convincing governments to end subsidies for fossil fuels um, when she was hosting the G7 um, I don't, uh, a number of years ago um, now. And, um, and now um, the fact that, you know, there may be some rollback and, you know, several leaders, um, including the Biden administration are talking about um, sort of a tax holiday um, on fuel taxes to try to deal with the energy crisis now. Um, but more importantly, as Champa pointed out, um, you know, the decisions about um, how much investment go into building LNG plants. Um, there's a number of politicians who have talked about building new pipelines, about seeking you know, gas elsewhere. Um, there is a consciousness, I think, among leaders, um, you know, some, some about not having, being locked in, uh, not either creating standard assets or creating um, an environment in which it will be difficult uh, to uh, move to greener technologies because um, there will be abundant, maybe cheaper uh, gas available. Um, you know, there are some ways to mitigate that. I think Germany has been very conscious in, um, uh, of uh, trying to build either um, LNG terminals that could uh, be adapted to hydrogen or um, have sort of limits on um, the, the number of years um, that the kinds of investments that they are making in fossil fuel infrastructure um, and how long um, it would take place. But of course, Germany, among other EU countries, is now uh, restarting its coal plants. Um, so at the same time as the G7 summit, you know, we saw um, hours of negotiations between uh, the national environment ministers of the EU um, to talk about how to implement um, its very ambitious um, climate goals and um, the headline targets were left unchanged. So it just shows how little appetite there is for increasing climate ambitions, given the effects of Russia's war on Ukraine and soaring energy prices, inflation. Um, in, in fact, there were quite a number of tweaks, um, sort of and carve outs um, that were added. Um, so I worry about this looking ahead to the COP because the EU has always been a leader in this space. Um, and, um, you know, both in saying, but also in showing that it is willing to negotiate with uh, Poland, um, which is very dependent on coal or other states, um, you know, within the bloc to try to arrive at these very, very difficult compromises and move forward. And if we go into a COP without um, a European Union that is a leader on climate change, then we're going to have a very different conversation there. Thank you, Alyssa. And I can hear your daughter. Laika has found her chew toy in the background. So good to know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, so, uh, I mean, we, we have covered quite a lot. Thank you so much, Alyssa and Champa. You know, you really are experts 
in your own field and it's been great to hear from you very insightful i i a final question for me because we've been looking forward um we've talked about you know the g7 the nato summit the upcoming cup uh the, the, there's a G20 summit um, slated for November, which of course includes Russia. And given that the G7 uh, made some progress, but failed maybe to make significant progress, especially on you know IMF special drawing rights, as Champa talked about, you know to really help alleviate the, the 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 hardest blow for many of the most vulnerable countries. You know what can we expect from the G20, and uh, especially given vast russia divisions um or is that too long in the future to to predict maybe champa first and then we can go to elisa i think it's difficult to say because it's always been seen as a a weaker or secondary body to the g7 but actually if you look at the g20 i think it's important to think through you know what what is possible through that body and one of the pillars for their four meetings that's going to be taking place later this year is on sustainable energy transition now with russia being part of that conversation it's, it's very difficult to see how that conversation is going to happen in the way necessarily that's needed, because I imagine that's going to be one of the agenda items where you can see a lot of tension between some of those countries in the West who want to see robust action on Russia and other countries uh, who are part of the G20 that are still engaging with Russia, India, Indonesia and others. So I think in that respect, it's difficult to see how that will play out. But I think there's a recognition amongst broader G20 countries that the current status quo is not sustainable. And they are looking to transition to green energy, but they want to do that. They need the financing to be able to do that transition, where sometimes I think you see a pushback from uh, you know, Global South G20 economies is where there's a sense of, or oh, you want us to reduce um, reliance on dirty fuels, but you're not willing to invest to help us to transition. And that, that fuel is essential to our development. So I think, you know, if Western countries want to influence G20 countries in terms of, you know, showing that they really are committed to helping these countries transition to green energy or to more sustainable energy, that has to come with actual financing to help those countries to do that, recognizing the sort of development needs that those countries have, where they do have, you know, um, inequalities in their countries, poverty in their countries, trying to find ways to address the needs of their populations. They can't wait 10, 20, 30 years. So I think in that respect, you know, it's a difficult set of considerations for Western countries to handle, which is one, being robust with Russia, two, recognizing the economic and energy needs of developing country economies, and then three, being able to put forward actual um, initiatives that will really help those countries. And I think that's, that will be key to see what comes out of the G20, dis uh, G20 discussions, whether there's meaningful progress on a sustainable energy transition, or you see what you happen with the G7, where you have a restatement of things that have been said before, but no real forward motion. Thank you, Champa. We've received one uh, additional question, which is about um, just energy transition partnerships. Um, it's a Hopkin, Hopkins podcast on foreign affairs who was asking us, and how infrastructure development um, I'm guessing in conflict zones in particular fits in with with sustainability and what we've been talking about here um, about the, the sort of and I guess this also sort of links to uh, our vision of adaptability and understanding how that applies in conflict zones in particular. Yeah, and I think infrastructure financing is interesting because that's often a space of geopolitical competition. So you know you have China's um, one belt one road, then the G7 come up with their own initiatives, build back better. And it goes back and forth, back and forth. But in that respect, it's, it, it needs to be really driven by what countries need and shaped and informed by what is most going to help them in terms of their economic um, and development needs. And I think at the moment, what you have is big sums of money being thrown out. We're going to do this, we're going to do that. But it seems to be a battle for influence rather than something that's really genuinely going to shift um, what's needed within these countries. So I think in that respect, Infrastructure is important, infrastructure financing is important, but for us, what we want to do is ensure that that's done in a sustainable way, that that's done in a conflict sensitive way, and that those considerations don't take a backseat um, to geopolitical considerations. Our concern would be whether geopolitics politics overshadow or lead to bad decisions in terms of the infrastructure that's supported, rather than making sure things are done that ensure inclusivity of communities, making sure that local communities are involved in the design and development of infrastructure, making sure that nobody's, um, you know, nobody's livelihoods are impacted, that they're not displaced by these mega projects. So I think it's so key to make sure that, the, that this 
financing that's going towards infrastructure that is very welcome has to be done in a locally sensitive and conflict sensitive way to make sure that it really supports climate adaptation and really helps vulnerable communities and doesn't become instrumentalized for geopolitical purposes. Now, of course, that's always going to be part of the mix, right? You're not going to have blocks of countries putting forward this money and not wanting to get, you know, not wanting it to serve any of their agenda. But I think there have to be ways in which we make sure that we don't lose sight of the people most impacted and that this actually services what they need. Thank you, Champa. Um, we are now out of time. Uh, I want to thank everyone who took the time to be with us on Crisis Group's first Twitter space. Uh, we did miss Richard Gowan, who was actually the most entertaining Crisis Group uh, Twitter staffer. So I do recommend you follow him. And maybe, Gowan, you can, I know that you're listening, you're lurking, so uh, you can you can post all of the, the witty things that you would have said on the space uh, in, a, in a Twitter thread. And uh, we will get you to moderate uh, an upcoming one so that our listeners and our followers don't miss out on, on your insights. Of course, you're also a, a great multilateral expert. So um, Alissa de Carbonell, who is the deputy program direc director for our Europe and Central Asia program. I recommend that you follow her on Twitter as well as Champa Patel, who is our director of In innovation and the deputy director of our future of conflict program. Um, Crisis Group is actually has an upcoming um, a Q and A on climate security and COP. So I recommend if you are interested in in hearing more about what Champa has explained here, um, stay tuned for that. And uh, you can actually find all of these both our Ukraine coverage, which we're covering quite extensively, as you heard, those of you us who have been here for the hour, Alyssa was in Ukraine uh, doing research. She's just back this weekend, so we will have something coming out on that very soon. And um, we also have a special uh, page that is linked to everything that Crisis Group is doing relating to the upcoming COP in November, the climate uh, conference in Egypt. Uh, as we've discussed, we see the link between climate change and conflict as a real priority for a, a conflict prevention and conflict mitigation NGO like Crisis Group. So thank you all so much for being here. Um, if you have any particular questions after this, you can always send us a direct message. And um, we look forward to repeating the, 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 the Twitter space again. So um, thank you for being here and have a nice evening, morning, night, wherever you are in the world. Thank you all. And thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.